Many times people will come to me and they'll say something like, John, I would like to spend a day with you. I understand that thought. I understand that comment. They're really saying, John, if, you know, I'd like to see what your day is really like. And, um, you know, every day has a lot of things that are different about it. But I did that question and that thought brought me to a, a lesson I kind of want to teach you today called Five Things That I Do Every Day. And the five things that I do every day, I would say, um, are the secret of my success. I, I've often said that uh, your daily agenda, what you and I do every day, determines the level of our success. You let me you let me spend a day with you, and I just need to hang. I really don't need to interact with you. I just need to watch you. If you gave me one day, I, I could promise you by the end of that day, with pretty good accuracy, pretty good accuracy, I could um, tell you how successful you're going to be. Because there are certain things that you you just pick up from spending a day with. I mean, if I have a day with you, I'm going to pretty well figure out what kind of attitude you have. If I if I spend a day with you, I'm going to figure out how well you prioritize. If I spend a day with you, I'm going to figure out if you're disciplined or not. I mean, it doesn't take long to find the things, the ingredients that make people successful. So when people say, well, John, if I spend a day with you, you know, what would I see? Well, it depends. Some days I'm writing, some days I'm speaking, some days I'm in the studio like I am today. So my days are different, but but there are five things every day that I do intentionally. Now, these five things, here's the good news. These five are so simple, every one of you can do these. This, this is not complicated, it's not hard, it's not difficult. They're all simple, but they are all powerfully successful if you do it. The key is action. You, you've got to do them. So let me give you the five things that, that I intentionally do every day. Number one is, is, is I learn every day. I have a capacity and curiosity to keep learning. I never have gotten to this place where, you know, some people have this kind of, I've been there, done that kind of a mind. Oh, I've been there. I've done that. Well, I've been a lot of places and I've done a lot of things. But been there, done that doesn't do anything to provide any kind of a growth for tomorrow. You see, the only guarantee that I have that tomorrow's going to get better today is that I'm growing today. And the only way that I can grow today is by learning. My, my mentor, John Wooden, had a great statement. He, he would look at me often and he'd say, John, it, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. And what Coach Wood realized is there's a whole bunch of people that they they get stuck on know-it-all. They get stuck on the fact, I've been there and done that. And all of a sudden, they, they cease to be hungry to learn. They cease to have a desire to perhaps uh, uh, stretch in their capacity. And, and so just never lose that that desire to read and to listen and to learn and and and, 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 it, and to grow. I... I uh, I, a fun story. I was in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I was speaking for a large company and the CEO, I was in his office and he had to leave the office for about five minutes. And I said, I'll just sit here and wait on you. And I looked up at his bookshelf and he had a lot of my books. And, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm thrilled. He has my books. He reads them. And so I thought I would surprise him. And, you know, so I, I would maybe sign a few of them. So I reached up and picked one of them up and opened it up to sign it. And I, as soon as I opened it up, I thought, wow, this book hasn't been opened before. He hasn't read this book. So I thought I'd have some fun, and I just put his name there, and I just wrote the words, please read me. And uh, and then I signed my name. I stuck it up, pulled up and down, pulled down another book, opened it up. I thought, oh, this one hasn't been read either. And so I put his name, and I put, please read me also. And I signed my name and stick it back up. And you can see where this one's going. I picked, pulled down the third book off the bookshelf, and it hadn't been opened. It hadn't been read. And so now I'm getting a little more desperate. So I put his name and I said, uh, please read me also. And then I put, when you do, call. And I put my cell phone number in there and I signed it and put it back up. And he never called me. Okay. Now here's a person who was in a high position, but he stopped learning. There came a time where he somehow thought, wow, I, I, I know enough, I am enough. And I just want you to know that we don't know enough. So every day, every day I learn. Every day, number two, is I, I, I reflect. 
Um, you know, re- reflection turns experience into insight. So when people say experience is the best teacher, that's just not true. Yeah, it's a common statement, but it's a stupid one, to be honest with you. If experience were the best teacher, everybody, as they had more experience, as they got older, they get better. And most people, they're getting older, they're not getting better. They've got more experience, but they've never evaluated the experience. You see, it's not experience that's the best teacher. It's evaluating the experience. It's out of the, eva- you know, what did I learn from what I just did that really brings the fruit? It, when, so when my children were growing up, every week we would do different experiences. And they knew that I'd ask them two questions. If I asked my children this question once, I've asked them 10,000 times as they grew up. We'd finish the experience. And I'd look at them and say, hey. What did you love? What did you learn? What did you love? What did you learn? For a kid, they can tell you what they love a lot quicker than what they learned. And so I always ask it that way. And when my grandchildren came along, I've asked them now thousands of times, what did you love? What did you learn? What what am I doing? I'm teaching them to evaluate their experience because awareness is huge. Listen, you have to know yourself to grow yourself. And, and one of the great mistakes we make in life is the fact that we're unaware. And so every day I reflect so I can increase my awareness. Every day, I, I, so every day I reflect, every day I learn, every day I write. You say, well, of course you write every day, John. You're an author. You're a writer. No. No, I, I, I write every day because writing does two, maybe three things for me that are essential for my development. Uh, one is I write, I, when I, whenever I get, get a good thought, I write it down. In fact, today I was doing an interview and a podcast, and the person I was interviewing, in fact, it was Don Yeager, he, he, he said something that was very important. So right in the middle of the interview, I'm getting my iPhone out, and I'm writing down his thought. It's cool because I don't want to lose it. So I write to capture the thought. I also write to clarify the thought. Um, writing brings clarity to a thought much better than just listening. And there's something about when you see it um, that it just becomes more clear. And I also write to create the thought because what I've found is once I start writing a thought down, many times it leads to another thought. You know, a a great idea is an accumulation of several good ideas. And so every day I write. I, I, I write so I can capture the thought, clarify it, maybe even create another thought. Every day, number four, I share. It's very important for you to take what you're learning and pass it on to others. And it's very important for you to talk your thought out. Um, There's something magic that happens with sharing your thought. Uh, One one plus one equals, if if you have a good thought and you share a good thought with me, and I have a good thought and I share it with you, okay, the natural thing is to say we have two good thoughts, but usually that stimulates another thought. You know, one plus one equals three in sharing. There's a compounding that once that we begin to verbalize. And so there's a beautiful thing about sharing that, that thought. And then every day I also, I not only share the thought, I sustain the thought. I, every day I, I work on continually thinking about what I learned. Uh, it, the true experiment, they put 10 people in a room and they give them a thought. They give them an idea and they said, we want you to, we want you to take that idea and, and, and maximize its potential. An hour later, they go into the room with 10, and, and they've taken the idea, and, and obviously they've, they're sharing, and, and it's gotten better. And then they remove five. It doesn't matter which five they remove. It doesn't matter at all. It could be the smartest five, the dumbest five. I don't care. And they give those the last five one more hour to think upon that idea 100% of the time. At the second hour, the idea has gotten better. Why? It's because it's been sustained. It was held on long enough to really develop. So every day I sustain my thinking, every day I share my thinking, pretty much every day I write my thinking, every day I reflect my thinking, and yes, every day I learn so I have something to think upon. Simple, isn't it? You can do that. In fact, for the next 30 days until I see you next month, Practice this and see what happens. We're always anxious to improve our circumstances. We're always anxious to to fix the things around us. But so many times we're not anxious to improve ourselves. 
and, and fix ourselves. And so the whole teaching of this is, is that when we start in life, we, you probably started off like I did, and that, that is with, with goal setting. And um, well, let me just tell you a story. Kirk Kampmeyer, when I was in my early 20s, asked me what my plan for growth was. And the bottom line is I didn't have a plan for growth. I didn't know that I was supposed to have a plan for growth. Um, he was the first one that kind of made me aware that, John, growth's not automatic. If you're going to grow, you have to grow intentionally. And uh, so I, I said, okay, I'm going to grow intentionally, but, but I didn't know how to grow. I mean, no one ever, you know, it, it's one thing to ask yourself if you have a growth plan, but I didn't have a growth plan. And I went to my friends and asked them if they had a growth plan, and none of them did. And so... I, I desperately began to say, well, how do I grow myself? How do I develop myself? And so I brought something very personal to me today uh, because I'm holding in my hand the, the, where I started my growth plan. This is the dynamics of personal goal setting and it's personal success planner. And it was by Paul Meyer, Success Motivation Institute. And this is where I started. This is, this is my first, I, in fact, paid $799 for this. Okay, and when I paid seven hundred ninety-nine dollars for this, uh, that year I made—I I, was—I started off as a, as a pass. I, that year I made forty-eight hundred dollars. So this was huge. This was a, a lot of money, and, and I had to save up for it. I didn't have that kind of money, and so really six months of, of trying and saving, we, we finally got to this. And, and so this is where I started, and, and uh, it, it's, just, it's just very important. It's very special to me. But but I started my personal growth plan with a goal setting teaching. And it's got cassette tapes in here and it's got workbooks and I worked it through. And I really went through this personal growth plan three times. It, you know, the first time I, I got it, I thought went back to get some more and it took me, so I went through it three times. But the reason I brought this with me today is, is for a couple of reasons. One is, is this is when people say, what's the best investment you've ever made in your life? The best investment I've ever made in my life is right here. The $799 I paid, which was an awful lot of money for me, the $799 I paid has been worth millions of dollars for me. The return is incalculable. And, and the reason I say that is because I'm going to challenge you in a personal growth way to invest in yourself. In fact, if you wouldn't invest in yourself, why should anyone else invest in you? I'm always amazed at people who Want me to scholarship them? Want to, you know, would you, but you know, would you, could you kind of give me a, give me a, 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 a free lift? And my whole process, no, no, if, if you and I don't bet on ourselves, why should anyone else bet on us? The first bet that I ought to pay is, is on myself. And so this is my first kid. And, and so I brought it with you today to say that I literally started my growth, my whole growth life. Goal setting, and isn't it interesting, I'm talking to you about how do you and I leadership, how do we shift from, from being a, a, a goal setter to a person a, a, that just really works on growth? Because here's what, I, here's what I realized when I started in my growth plan. What I realized was this. The goals I achieved were not as great or as important as the growth that I was receiving in my life. That yes, I was setting goals and, and I was stretching towards those goals and it was a good thing, but, but it was, there was something happening in, in, internally to me that was more than, than places I wanted to go and, and numbers that I, I wanted to reach. And I, I, ex, I experienced two what I call growth changes that I want to give to you. Because I think that when you get on a growth journey that's intentional, you'll discover these same changes also. And the first one is very simple, and that is that I went from growth in everything to growth in essential things. When I started off with my growth, I just said, well, I want to learn everything. And so I just read and, and studied and, and listened to tapes, and I just did everything I could to grow. And, and I was just grow, growth, grow. And, and one day it hit me that that was never going to get me to where I wanted to be. That I had to go from trying to grow in every area and everything to, to grow, get, get, get essential. What are the main things that, that you just need to grow in? Now, for me, in my 20s, I came to the conclusion that if I could, um, if I could be successful in relationships, 
if I could be, become successful in training and equipping people, if I could have a, an incredible attitude that would help me be an overcomer, and if I could learn to lead and, and, and increase influence, if I could do those four things, relationships, equipping, attitude, leadership, if I could grow in those four areas, that I probably could be successful. And so I committed that these are the areas I'm going to grow in. And so I, I began to eliminate a lot of stuff so that I could grow in what I would call, for me, the main stuff. And I would say to each one of you in all of our sites and here locally that, that what you've got to do is when you start your growth plan, becoming intentional, you got to ask yourself, what are the areas I'm going to grow in? You can't grow in everything. You don't even want to grow in everything, but you, but you got to grow in the essential things. For me, R-E-L, relationships, equipping, attitude, and leadership. And later on, I, I added communication because I knew that I would spend my life as a, a connector and a communicator. And because I am a person of faith, faith. And pretty much for 40 plus years, these have been my six essentials. Learning how to connect with people, learning how to train, equip others, having an attitude to help me overcome, learn how to lead and expand influence, learn how to communicate well, and, and, and then become the person of faith that, that I really want to become. This, this, has become. this is where I really spent my time. The second change I had in the area of growth was I went gro from growth with a timeline to growth without a finish line. Now, this was a, an amazing experience that I had because when I started my growth journey, I, I, I thought in terms of, well, okay, uh, there'll be a, a, a finish line somewhere. There'll be a, a time when, when I've accomplished that. There'll be a time where I have achieved this. There'll be a time where I have arrived. And so I, so I, had, a, I had a timeline out there, and... I heard Earl Nightingale say that if you spent an hour a day every day on a certain given subject, now that's back to the essentials, R-E-A-L, that stuff. If you spent an hour a day every day on a, on a certain given subject for five years, you could become an expert on that subject. Now, that really excited me because at this time, I'm falling in love with leadership. I'm, I'm buying into the idea. Everything rises and falls on leadership. And so here we go. I, I'm excited, and I said, okay, I'm going to spend an hour a day every day for five years to become an expert on the subject of leadership. And that's what I did. Now, back then, there were not a lot of leadership books out. They were mainly management books. If you go back in the, well, if you go back in the 70s and 80s, you go into bookstores, you didn't find leadership books. You found management books. And, and so I read some management books, and it, it, it kind of got me going in the, in the right way. But I would talk to people that were leaders. I would try to do leadership experiences an hour every day. And, and every day, every week, as I would go through this process, I'd ask myself this question, how long will it take? Well, Earl Nightingale said it'd take five years. Well, so, I, so I'm, now I'm, I, I'm not only reading and studying and learning and experiencing, guess what else I'm doing? I, I'm counting down. I, 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 I think I'm Mr. Cape Canaveral. And I'm going, you know, five, you know, wow, four, you know, woo three. And, I'm, and, and I, can, I can smell it. I, it's out there. I'm, I'm getting close. That, there's going to be some light in this tunnel pretty soon. And I was about halfway in this five-year run of countdown until something happened. It wasn't anything I read. It wasn't anything that somebody came and set aside me and, and mentored me on or, or kind of gave me some thoughts or advice. About halfway in this journey, the inside of me switched. I was receiving so much value from my personal growth. I was, I, I was learning so much about leadership. I, I, was, I, I was growing so much internally that I stopped counting. And I, I left the question, how long will it take? And I picked up the question, How far can I go? I would love to talk about this idea of daily agendas from yeah. your perspective, John, but then certainly to you, James, and then again, John, go for it with your questions. But let's talk about daily agendas and their impact on long-term success. James, what Mark is talking about there is I, I, I wrote a book called Today Matters a long time ago. And the, basically the thesis of the book is that I can, if I could spend a day with you, I could pretty much at the end of the day tell you how successful you are because the secret of our success is determined by what we do daily. It's, it's the daily habits. And, and, and so I've talked about that a lot. And I think one of the reasons your book connected so much with me is that 
you have a terrific way of expressing and teaching that is very um, practical. But every time I read one of your illustrations or, or your next principle, it was like I'm thinking, I've always, I've thought this, but James just wrote it. It, it was like you clarified it. I mean, it was like, okay, inside you're agreeing with that, but on the outside, you visually, with, with the written word, just, I think, really bring the aha moment to the person that's felt it, but never quite expressed it as clearly as you have. Yeah, thank you for saying that. I actually think that's one of the best compliments that I can get as a writer, which is, you know, I've always kind of thought this, or I this matches up with my personal experience, but I've just never quite heard it put that way. And I think a lot of what I try to do, kind of try, I try to hit that mark or hit that target. And um, I'll have readers come up to me and they'll say, you know, hey, I have one guy come up. He said, I'm training for the Boston Marathon. Like I've been doing so many of the things in this book. And I just never realized it or didn't really th think about it that way. And um, a lot of this really resonated with me because I've been doing this stuff for years. And I thought, wow, what a great proof of concept. You know, like that made me feel really good about the book. Like here's somebody who's getting real results in the world. And they're like, yes, this is exactly what's worked for me. I just didn't have a way of a language for it. I just didn't have a way to express it. And so uh, to a large degree, I'm not really saying anything new. I'm just trying to find maybe a different line of attack or a slightly different explanation or a story that kind of brings the concept to life. I'm just trying to take these things that have been true for a very long time and useful in many different contexts and put them in a way that's easy to understand and easy to apply. And so my real job is the distilling of the idea or the principle into something actionable rather than coming up with something brand new. And you did it well. And if, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about the ice cube for a moment, okay? Because I just, I mean, it, it is, it's such a beautiful illustration of our work is stored up before it shows up. And I think, I think a big miss for a lot of us, James, is that in the stored up stage of our life, we get discouraged. And, and we just say, well, you know, I've, I've been working on this. I, nothing is happening, which we know things are happening, but, but we don't see it. So, and, and of course, then you use the, the same illustration, basically, as the hammering the, the rock and, you know, on the thousandth hit, all of a sudden it breaks or cracks in the process. So I'd like you to teach this because I just feel it is so encouraging to people that are trying to get some good habits but sometimes they, the stored up stage just kind of is a little discouraging for them because they're, they're, they're looking for something tangible to see. Well, one of the great challenges with building better habits is that you show up and you do the right thing and then you feel like you don't have anything to show for it. You know, like take my parents, for example, they like to swim. And one of the challenging things about swimming is their body looks exactly the same when they get out of the water as it did when they jumped in, right? Like they have no physical evidence that that workout was worth it. It's only months or maybe even years later that you get kind of the physical results you were hoping for. Or ever, we can all think of like work projects. Maybe you have a team meeting, you know, you're meeting every week to work on this feature to ship this product and it's six months in and the thing is still a mess. You haven't shipped it yet. Or, you know, I'm sure, John, you've had this before with book manuscripts. I know that I have this with Atomic Habits. I've been working on this thing for a year and a half and it's still unfinished, you know, and like it's very easy to get dis discouraged in those moments because you're like, I thought I was doing the thing I'm supposed to do, but I still don't have the result I was hoping for. And I like to encourage people to think about this kind of metaphor of an ice cube. You know, imagine you walk into a room. It's cold. You can see your breath. Say it's like 25, 26 degrees. An ice cube sitting on the table and you slowly start to heat the room up. 27, 28, 29. Ice cube still sitting there. 30, 31. And then all of a sudden you get to 32 degrees. And it's this one degree shift, no different than the other shifts that have just come before. But suddenly you hit this phase transition and the ice cube melts. And a lot of the time working on your habits or trying to get better results in life is kind of like that. You know, you, you show up and you keep making these small improvements and nothing happens. And you just have to wait until you hit the phase transition for that kind of moment to occur. And that work that you were putting in, it wasn't wasted. It was just being stored, you know, kind of like complaining about running for a month and not seeing a change in your body, for example, is sort of like complaining about heating an ice cube up from 25 to 30 degrees and it not melting yet. It's like, well, you just haven't hit the phase transition. 
Um, and there are a lot of things in life that are like that. And I think that doesn't necessarily mean this is going to feel easy all the time, but knowing that that is a reality and that that work is often stored um, and you have to wait for it to get to that moment where it's revealed, just knowing that is true puts you in a slightly better mindset to handle the difficulty of showing up again and needing to continue banging on the rock before it, it finally splits. Yeah, I just love the illustration. It makes all the sense of the world. And I think that, uh, again, for many of us, the stored up stage, we, it, we, we have to understand that the real work is done in the stored, stored up stage as much as it is in the showed up stage. It's just we don't get visually rewarded for it. And so therefore we get a little bit discouraged. Um, another thing that you said that I would love for you to talk about um, well, you talked about grow, uh, goals and systems, sure, okay? Sure. And and in the, in the goals and systems, the way you said it was better than the way I said it, but let me just give you a little background. I When I started off as a young leader, I set a lot of goals. I took goal-setting seminars and, you know, did goal-setting practices. And then one day I, I began to understand that I would hit a goal and then i kind of look and say, well, what's next? And and I felt that there was a missing piece. And so I kind of shifted from being goal-oriented to growth-oriented. Still had I still had goals in my life, but I said, I want to grow in this area. I want to grow in the leadership lane. And so, but when I saw that you talked about the systems, which are the processes, you know, it's the process. I love that because I th I felt, I felt when you spoke of that, that this is a big miss with a lot of people, that they are kind of outside directed with the goals and, 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 and they don't have that process, that system that allows them to, to really long-term sustain and continue to go, be, go beyond your, because I say, if you're growth oriented, you'll hit a goal and you'll say, that's nice, but you just keep on going mm -hmm. because it's bigger than that. If you're goal oriented, sometimes you say, what do I do next? Okay, pick up on that one and, and, and take us to a new level, James. Well, I mean, first of all, this is coming from someone who, was very goal oriented for a long time. You know, I think in a lot of ways, everything I write in atomic habits is actually a little reminder to myself. You know, I make all of these same mistakes that everybody else makes. And so I kind of am coming up with these ideas because I need them, but I came across this sheet of paper a couple of years ago and it had a list of goals that I had written out to myself, like maybe 10 years prior. And it was kind of interesting looking through them uh, with that much distance from them because maybe 30% of the list or something are, are, were things that I had accomplished. And then the rest of the list were things I hadn't. And my first thought looking at it was, well, clearly writing the goal down wasn't the thing that made the difference. You know, like obviously if I would have, that would have been the, the secret, then I should have just hit them all. And um, what I realized looking at it was the ones that I made progress on were the ones that I had some kind of system around. And you know, we often tell these stories about behavior change and habits and how hard it is to build new habits, how difficult it is to change your behavior and, and all of that. And one of the stories that we will tell is something like, well, maybe if you really wanted it, maybe if you had better goals, maybe if you had more discipline, maybe if you had more grit. And, you know, I don't know that that's quite right. You know, certainly those are important qualities in life. But I think many people, certainly most people like listening to this conversation right now, genuinely do want to improve, genuinely do want to perform at a high level. So what I would say is if you're struggling to improve, the problem isn't you. The problem is your system. We don't change, not because we don't want to change, but because we have the wrong system for change. And I think we can even go a step further and say, listen, you don't rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. You know, so often in life, we're told you need to be more ambitious, set a bigger goal, think bigger, 10 extra vision. And thinking big has its place. Like I consider myself to be someone who thinks big, but the truth is setting the goal is kind of the easy part. You know, like I, I'm an author, right? Like I can set a goal to sell hundred million books. You know, it took me three seconds. Like the goal is not the hard part. It's building a system of behaviors that executes and carries you toward that outcome. And so what I would say is um, if I was going to put a little finer point on this language. What do I mean by goal and system? Your goal is your desired outcome, the target, the thing you're shooting for. What is your system? It's the collection of daily habits that you follow. And if there is ever a gap between your goal and your system, if there's ever a gap between your desired outcome and your daily habits, your daily habits will always win. 
you know, almost by definition, your current habits are perfectly designed to deliver your current results. So whatever system you've been running, whatever collection of habits you've been following for the last, say, six months or year or two years, it's carried you almost inevitably to the outcomes that you have right now. And that's kind of one of the great ironies of life. We, you know, we also badly want better results. We also badly want to make more money or reduce stress or be more productive or get in shape. But the result, results are not actually the thing that needs to change. It's like fix the inputs and the outputs will fix themselves. Design a better system, create a better collection of daily habits, and you'll be carried kind of naturally to a different destination. And that's why sometimes I'll say like, Goals are for people who care about winning once. Systems are for people who care about winning repeatedly. You know, if you want to get results again and again, then it's the system that drives you forward. So um, that's kind of my little take on systems and goals. I love what you just said there. That was great. I'll I'll, I'll write that down and give you credit somewhere. Uh, <laughs> Sounds great. That's great. So, so you, let's, let's stay a little bit kind of in that same territory because... One of the things I loved about Atomic Habits, James, it makes sense. It just makes sense. When you read it, you not only can understand it and apply it, it makes sense. And when you talked about the difference between becoming outcome-based or identity-based on goals and, 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 and where you're going, when I read that whole section, I thought that is right and reasonable. And, you know, I... I've got a cigarette habit and I'm trying to quit smoking versus I don't smoke. I mean, that I felt was just very impacting. So take us there a little bit, would you please? Well, I think this is pretty natural. I certainly have done it many times before. Um, a lot of the time when you want to change something or get a better result, you'll sit down and first you start thinking about what do I want to achieve? So what, what outcome do I want? And then, if you go a little bit beyond just dreaming about the outcome, you say, okay, well, I need some kind of plan. I need some sort of a process for this. And so you might say, just as an example, I want to lose 40 pounds. And so my plan is I'm going to go to the gym four days a week and I'm going to eat this new diet and so on. And usually it kind of stops there. And the implicit assumption kind of behind all of this is if I can follow this plan and get that result, then I'll be the kind of person that I want to be, or I'll, I'll be happier with who I am, or I'll be more satisfied with my results or something like that. And what I encourage in chapter two of the book is let's maybe flip that on its head for a minute and just say, hey, why don't we just start by asking ourselves, not what do I want to achieve, but rather who do I wish to become? And then you can build your habits around that identity and let that process kind of carry you forward. And then whatever results happen to bubble up along the way are the results that come along the way. And so I sort of think of it like, kind of like the layers of an onion. The outermost layer is your outcomes. One layer in is your process. And then the, the core of the onion is your identity. And um, what I've found is that, and I think many readers have, uh, would agree with this, the concept of trying to build identity-based habits of starting with who do you wish to become is more resilient for them because they can kind of carry it around from situation to situation. So for example, one reader, she had this concept of this identity of what would a healthy person do? And then whenever she walked around, she would just ask herself that question, that question all day. What would a healthy person do? Would they order the salad or order the burger and fries? What would a healthy person do? Would they walk, you know, five blocks to the next meeting or would they catch a cab or, you know, whatever. And they can walk around uh, all day long with that kind of identity in their mind. And that gives them a lens to make their daily decisions. And they start to feel more aligned with becoming the kind of person they want to be. Now, my big takeaway for this, and I think the way in which it ties into all of the concepts and atomic habits and the strategies for building small habits and getting better, is that your behavior provides uh, evidence of your identity. And so every action you take is like a vote for the type of person you wish to become. So no, doing one push up does not transform your body, but it does cast a vote for I'm the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. And no, writing one sentence may not finish the novel, but it does cast a vote for I'm a writer. And individually, those actions are small things, but collectively you start to build up this body of evidence for the type of person you are and what you stand for. And 
ultimately, I think this is the real reason that habits matter, which is they provide evidence for who you are. You know, we, we often talk about habits as mattering because of the external results they'll get you. Hey, they'll help you make more money or reduce stress or whatever. But the real reason they matter is they shape your sense of self. They kind of shape that narrative, that story that you have about who you are and what you do. And habits are not the only things in life that influence that picture or that story. But by virtue of being repeated day in and day out, habits provide the bulk of the evidence. They, they play a really significant role in shaping the way you see yourself. And so once you start to believe that you're that kind of person, you have every reason in the world to stick with the behavior, you know, like, especially once you take pride in it. I, you know, I always joke, like, if you take pride in the size of your biceps, you never skip arm day at the gym, you know, and once you start to take pride in a certain habit, it becomes easier to stick to it. Like the person who views themselves as I am a runner, they don't have to motivate themselves to go for a run in the same way that somebody who's just getting started might, you know, it's kind of like, no, like this is just part of what I normally do It's part of who I am. And so ultimately I think that's where we're trying to get to. Now it's hard to flip a switch on day one and just change your identity overnight. It usually doesn't happen that way. It's a gradual thing. It requires the casting of many votes to continue that metaphor and building up a body of evidence. But, um, but I do think it's possible. And a lot of the other tools and strategies in the book maybe can give you the short-term motivation that you need to get to that long-term place of kind of reshaping your story or shaping your identity. I do want to dig into your new book, Leveling Up, because I've yeah. now heard you talk on chasing failure, and uh, it's one of the best talks I've heard <laughs> on this subject matter. But uh, before we do go to leveling up today in the podcast, I do want to just camp out for a minute on chasing failure. Sure. Talk to me about your journey and and how that brought you to become a scholar of failure. I don't know if that's a compliment or not, man. You're a scholar right. on failure. Right. But uh, let's right. talk a little bit about what led to your great insight on failure. Yeah. You know, I, I grew up believing that failure is not an option until I started meeting successful people and realized, well, they've all failed. So uh, apparently it, it's an option. And uh, my wife and I, uh, we were uh, we got to go on a couple of different TV shows because she told a friend that she thought it would be cool to get engaged and married on the same day. I had no idea what that meant. So I guessed and began planning a wedding behind her back over the course of two years. And so June 7th, 2013, I get down on one knee. I say, Amanda, will you marry me? She says, yes. I said, just kidding. Will you marry me today? Open up a lounge room door. About 85 of our family and friends standing in there with the sign that says, today we were engaged for a good 11 hours, uh, made a documentary about it. It went viral. And so we get on a couple of these different TV shows in the, on the Queen Latifah show. And my wife surprises me by getting me connected with Kobe Bryant. And I absolutely lost my mind. And, and I played ball in college. And, and so huge NBA fan, huge Lakers, Kobe fan. And, and so... I get an opportunity three months from the recording of the Queen Latifah show to, to meet Kobe Bryant. So I'm like, man, if I'm getting ready to meet Kobe, I need to be getting ready to get in the league. And so there was this, you know, well, Ryan, you're six, three, you play ball in college, but there are levels to this thing. And so can you really, you know, make an NBA squad? Can you make a G league squad? And so for me, I just thought, man, you know what? I, I probably can't. So why not just hang that up and just go meet Kobe and be, be a normal person. Then I thought, man, here we are doing the thing that leaders do all the time, which is talk themselves out of their best ideas. And this was the day I said, you know what? Why don't I talk myself into being brave today? And so that day I started a, a second documentary called Chasing Failure, where I said, man, what if I get in the ring with failure? Let it give me its best shot. I'll give it my best shot. And let's just see what happens. And so I reached out to about five NBA teams and just said, hey, would you let a complete stranger <laughs> work out for your basketball team? I'll probably fail, but what if I don't? There's only one way for us to find out, and that's for you to let me try. I'm 6'3", 200 pounds, and looking for failure. Sincerely, Ryan Lee. It's like, <laughs> what do we have to lose? You know, it's like, we just think, like, you can't do that, and there's all of these rules and expectations that are put on us that I just love to stop every now and then and go, who's, who, who's making the rules of your life? Who's making the rules of your leadership? How, how, 
how who's governing this? It, sometimes it feels like we've got this middle school principal that's following us around, telling us what we can and can't do. But they're they're really self imposed rules. And so I said, if they put their emails on the internet, they must want to get emails from somebody. So why not me? And the, the first four teams said no. The fifth team said, yeah, we'll give you a shot. And that was the Phoenix Suns. And so I go to Phoenix and I try out for an NBA team. It was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. And I failed at a very, very high level. But what I realized when I got there was, wait a second, how in the world did I get here? There are so many rooms that I could be in at this point. But as I'm failing this tryout, I realized that chasing failure took me further than chasing success ever did because chasing failure led me to an NBA practice court. And I had been in a lot of rooms up to that point in my life, but never an NBA practice court. And so that just emboldened me to try things. And so now you talk eight years later, that trial was about eight years ago. Dude, we're just constantly trying things. You and I, before this podcast, we're going... We don't know what we're doing on X, but guess what? We're going to give it our best shot. That's exactly right. We're going to research. We're g- how, how are we going to, to, to grow our, our coaches? How are we going to go from 48,000 coaches to 75,000 coaches? It's like, uh, we don't actually know the answer to that question. But guess what we are committed to doing? Figuring it out. And most leaders are afraid to try things. Yeah. And so I think you can really stand out amongst the crowd when you're just say, Hey, I'm willing to fail. I'm willing to take those lessons. I'm willing to go get those lessons first. So you can come after me second and learn from my mistakes. I'm willing to do that. But when you're the first one to do it, you, you get something that the, the second doesn't, which That's is right. great. And so I think the more and more that I work with successful people all around the world, what they will tell you that they will never post is, I promise you, they all use the same phrase. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I, I don't know how we're going to do that. I don't know how we're going to take this company public. I don't know. Like, that's the secret sauce. I'm going, I know, me neither. Welcome to the club. <laughs> and so there is this pressure that I think leaders feel like I have to have all the answers, but... Dude, the best leaders in the world don't have the answers. And so, so I just, I have this, what I would call a spirit of chasing failure and have been on this journey for a long time of going, hey, let's learn as much as we possibly can from failure so that we can indeed succeed. But if we're afraid to fail, if we're waiting for things to be perfect, we will never move forward in our leadership. You know what's interesting? So one, podcast audience, viewers. By the way, if you're not viewing, you need to jump on because Ryan's a good-looking dude right here. You're, you're missing it if you're just listening and not jumping on YouTube. But Ryan, you, you said something right there that I don't want any of our podcast family to miss. You said when you are the first to try something, you get something that the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth don't get, and that is you get grit. And yep. that statement right there, cut the podcast off and go do <laughs> what you've been thinking about doing, but you're waiting for somebody else to try it because you want the Absolutely. grit because the grit will cause you to go farther, further and yep. longer than the next guy, the next guy, the next gal, the next gal. So let's go. Uh, those of you yeah. that are thinking about doing something. Hey, you talk about this chasing failure concept and, and you yeah. illustrate it on the journey of personal success so well. One of the things mm-hmm. that uh, we say on this podcast often, John's talked a little bit about it, is business leaders, leaders look at failure the same way they look at finances. They want to yeah. return on failure. We want to return mm-hmm. on investment. We want to return on our time. Yeah. We teach and have taught on this podcast that business leaders also get a return on failure. Talk to me about how failure is the source of leadership strength. You know, I, I think that there is something powerful about a mindset uh, I, that is okay with failure. I often say the most important conversation you're going to have all week is the conversation that you have with yourself. And what you tell yourself is so vitally important for for your growth. And so some people can sort of uh, wallow in their failures. They can start telling themselves a very negative story about what they've done 
But I think it's important that a person understands that failure is an event. It's not an identity. Some people want to wear their failures instead of just experiencing their failures. It's not who you are. It's something that happened. It's not a somebody. And sometimes we make that trip of going, man, I'm a failure. No, you failed. There is a massive difference. And so I think for a leader, whenever they drop a ball, they have to immediately have the correct conversation with themselves because they could say, man, I've made so many mistakes. I've destroyed it all. Well, did you destroy it? Or do you have the mindset of I'm rebuilding? I'm rebuilding it all. I'm already making my comeback. I'm going to make sure that I took great notes on the mistakes that I made. I'm not saying you didn't make any mistakes. I'm just saying you need new language for your leadership. You need new language for how you're going to start talking to yourself if you're going to be the kind of person that moves forward. The, the best thing that I've learned from John Maxwell is simply perspective. His perspective on leadership and situations and people. What impresses me the most about John is the amount of people that other people have deemed failures, he's looked at and said, mm, I see potential. So I'm going to invest in that person. I'm going to show up for that person and let's see what we can get out of them. What is that? It's just a mindset. It's all it is. It doesn't change what somebody did. It doesn't change uh, even who someone is, but it does change their mindset of going, I want to be the kind of leader that says, you know what, this is going to be a strength of mine in A, managing my failures, but then managing other people's failures is where it really gets very, very, uh, we talk about exponential impact. When, you, when you're able to look at somebody else's failures and show up for them and give them the right language to have, I think you're, you're stepping into a really great leadership space. You know, what I, what I love about you and John is your ability to span different, we call them streams of influence or different domains of yeah. influence. And, and so, so, I mean, you, you write, you speak, you, you mm -hmm. coach, you consult, you do films, you, you make films. And by the yeah. way, if you, I, I said this earlier, but if you want to see more about what all Ryan's doing, go to ryanleak.com because you will be impacted just by visiting the site. But Ryan, you've done that much like John, John speaker, writer, communicator, con consultant, coach. He's done all these things and somehow you two have figured out how to you, create a thread of influence, mm. impact, of messaging that connects all of those domains or all of those sphere of influences. Talk to us. We've got podcast listeners that come from all those different yeah. domains. How did you create a thread that connected all that you do? What a great question. I believe something that I learned a couple of years ago, I was at a conference. I was listening to a speaker that I didn't think was very good. I didn't think I actually thought it was boring. I, could, I didn't just think it wasn't very good. I actually thought it was very bad, if I'm being <laughs> honest. But yet there were people in the lobby that were going, that was the best speaker I've ever heard in my life. And I went, we need to get your ears checked. What is <laughs> happening? Like, how in the world could you think that was? I'm like, you just may not listen to a lot of speakers. I don't know what it is. But, but I realized something that day. Everybody is somebody's cup of tea. Everybody is somebody's cup of tea. And what it allowed me to do was to encourage anybody to say, hey, be yourself everywhere. And you go, you might be afraid to be yourself. You may be tempted to be more like John. You may be tempted to be like the person you read about. You may be tempted to be like somebody you follow on social media. I encourage people to be them selves because what people can sense regardless of the room that you're in whether we're talking professional sports c-suite executives healthcare finance political sphere you name it what all of those people have in common is they can smell a phony coming a mile away and when you can genuinely just be yourself there is something powerful about that, that people go, I trust this person. People trust John. When he walks through him, it's like, John's going to be John. John's not trying to be Tim. He's not trying to be Mark. 
He's not trying to be Ryan. He's just John. Yep. So for me, it, it, it took me a while to get comfortable in my own skin to be able to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to be myself everywhere. It, took, it was a journey, but I think that allowed me to just be authentic everywhere I go. I just did a talk this past week for a good friend of ours, Conway Edwards. This was the first time I was speaking for his organization. And so I'm thinking, all right, man, chasing failure. Here we go. He's like, nah, I, I don't want you to speak on chasing failure. Okay, we can move on to my next book, Leveling Up. He's <laughs> like, nope. I'm like, well, what about one of my old books, Unoffendable? Like, This is my first time in front of your audience of 12,000 people. And he said, nope, I want you to talk on parenting. <laughs> Con Conway, why, 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 what? Can we can we talk about this? He goes, no, I, I think he'd be excellent at it. And he's Jamaican, right? So he's got his Jamaican ac ac accent. He's going, I think he'd be great at it. I'm like, Conway, can we? Do there's so many other things that I have expertise on that I would love to share with this rather large audience. But there's something powerful about talking about your weakness. Yeah. To be able to stand before an audience and go, hey, I'm not here to give you uh, parenting expert advice. I've got an eight-year-old and a four-year-old, which means I'm at about a halfway point of their adolescence for yeah. my eight-year-old. So, hey, I'm not here to be the expert, but I'm going to tell you what I'm learning as a parent right now. And you'd be surprised how well a message like that is received where it's not a, hey, I'm this know-it-all and you all need to listen to me. It's more of a, I'm one of you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to raise two men of God that honor the people in their life, that do business the right way, that treat people the right way, that treat women the right way, that operate their finances with integrity. All these are things that I'm consistently navigating versus. Hey, let me give you three tips on yeah. how to be a better parent because I'm amazing. So what it does is it allows me as a leader to step into a room to go, let me first ask questions and let me empathize with people in the room to say, hey, I do have a, a vast variety of experiences with global leaders. However, it does not make me a know-it-all. And so I've found that when you ask questions first, it puts people in because people can kind of have their armor up with who's this guy? Who does he think he is? But when there's a genuine, hey, I'm, I'm really trying to get to know you. I'm not just rinse and repeat. I'm not just going to do the last talk that I did before. And I want to know about your audience. And I want to know what they're struggling with. And I want to know what you're struggling with. And I want to make sure that I'm able to add value to what's happening in this room. And I'm not going to assume this room is just like the last one. So I think that is the thread that is going to be the same everywhere. Like, Ryan's going to be human when he walks in the room, whether it's a boardroom or a locker room, I'm coming in with my full humanity, not my, hey, hi, I'm Ryan and I'm an expert and you all should listen to me. You know what I, what I love about your, and I'm going to stay with Chase and Failure, one more question and then I promise you I want to sure. move to leveling up. But yeah. um, one of the things I love about your story is you show chasing failure really could be also chasing opportunity. What you did with Kobe, what you did with your wife, all of us want to sense and seize an opportunity like Ryan Leak. Everyone, yeah. just listen to Ryan. He's going to make you find what could be and probably should be and probably will be, to be honest with you, failure. He sees it through a lens of opportunity. Opportunity. But your yeah. message is much deeper than that, Ryan, because also mm. there is a reoccurring theme in all of your chasing failure that is about resilience. And, I, and before we leave chasing failure, you're, you're brilliant in your resiliency. And I'm telling you, I work with corporations mm. all around the globe. I work with leaders yeah. right now post-COVID that are dealing with the fact that people are not resilient anymore. So before we leave yeah. chasing failure, how do we turn adversity into a transformational force mm. by allowing resiliency to drive the leader's day? Uh, I... I think that was very well, well said. Resilience is absolutely required for the future. Mm. 
there is no version of our future that does not require resilience. There's always going to be a setback. The world is constantly changing. Are you? Are you adapting with yeah. those changes wow. or simply getting mad that it changed? You can't do both. <laughs> you need energy to do one or the other. And so I've just decided as a leader, I'm moving forward. The good old days are gone. 2019 isn't coming. People love the glory days, the BC days before COVID. Yeah. It, it's, they're gone. And so at some point we have to move on. There are economists that are predicting a, a global depression in 2030. Um, election season is, is around the corner here in America. All of these things can shake somebody's foundation. But I think the most important piece about resilience isn't just having it, but planning it. Wow. I've wow. already planned on being resilient in an election year, regardless of how an election goes. Excellent. I've man. already planned on what my mindset's going to be in the future because I'm not going to be caught off guard by people being mad at each other in an organization. Like some people allow chaos to take them by surprise and they're like, oh my gosh. And so now you're being a reactive leader. So there's a fire. Oh, let's go get the water hose. No, proactive leader. Hey, let's make sure we've got hoses everywhere. Hey, let's make sure that people are fireproof, that people are ready for things to burn. You want to know why? Because that's called life. And that's just how the world works. And so I plan on being resilient because I know there are going to be setbacks. Yes, uh, they are. Some people say that another pandemic is coming, which means as a person that does live events, that could change things for me. I'm not going to be surprised by that. I'm simply going to be prepared for it. When you're prepared for chaos, you don't have to be scared of chaos. So for us, we're just prepared. We are literally planning resilience for the future. And it's very important as a leader that we continue to be the adult in the room because kids are going to freak out whenever there's chaos. But there ha the leader has to be the adult in the room that says, hey, we're going to be okay. Sometimes we're going to take some hits, but we have to continue to get back up. There will be budget cuts. There will be times where a staff member tells you they're there for life and then they leave the next week. Prepare for it now. Prepare for people to lie. Prepare for people to, to steal. These things happen, but I've already made up my mind what kind of leader I'm going to be in the future before it happens. I want to jump into... This quote you have in the book that says, if you see yourself as a loser, you won't play like a winner. If you see yourself as a winner, you won't play like a loser. What advice do you give to someone having a hard time seeing themselves as a winner? How do, they, how do you get them first to see themselves as a winner so they can start playing like a winner? Yeah, so the concept is this to start. Success is an identity process and you'll never outperform the way you see yourself. Mm -hmm. And so one of the first things we want to do is to update our identity, just like you update the software on your on your iPhone. You want to update your own personal identity The okay. tell people you are not who you are. You are who you were born to be. And you are also not what you did. You are what you repeatedly do. We all make mistakes, but you can update your identity and create new habits, new patterns, new thought patterns. So I'll share a, a quick story uh, of, of a dear friend of mine. You want to know, it's interesting, Mark. This dear friend of mine, his name's Jaime Molina, lives out in Southern California, one of the sweetest men you'll ever meet. The last time Jaime and I were together, by the way, was in Orlando at, a, at uh, the the uh, certification for the John Maxwell coaches. That's how, okay. We actually have a selfie with him together. That's the last time we were together. So he's a he's a he's an avid John Maxwell fan as well. The only person sweeter, by the way, than Jaime is his wife, Ramona. They're, they're very <laughs> devout in their Catholic faith. Uh, Jaime's in the financial services industry. Uh, he has four beautiful daughters. You would want your daughter to marry Jaime. Jaime's one yeah. of those kind of men, just a good yeah. man. So he, one of the things he does is he works with the troubled youth in his in his community. And he tells these the youth about a story about a man named E9400. 
E9400 was born on a border town with Mexico in the States in Texas, El Paso. At age eight, he was introduced to alcohol. At age nine, he was sexually abused and became sexually active at age nine. At age 14, he got into hard drugs. At 15, he became a, a mule for the cartel. At age 24, he was convicted of 11 uh, federal felonies and served multiple years in San Quentin. Now, Mark, you don't want to serve prison time anywhere, no. but you definitely mm -hmm. don't want to serve prison in San Quentin. This is a really, no. really, really terrible place where the harshest rapists and the harshest murderers go to serve their time. So Jaime asked the students, he says, let me ask you a question. What do you think happened to E9400? Like, Mark, if we were doing a poll, right, with our listeners, we do a poll. Hey, is he, is, he, uh, is he an alcoholic? Is he on drugs? Is he in prison? Is he, at, is he dead? Is he living his best life? Like, what are the odds of these different things? Remember, at age eight, we, he is introduced to alcohol. Nine, he, becomes, he gets abused and becomes sexually active. Fourteen's on hard drugs. Fifteen's a mule. Serves in San Quentin through all of his 20s. What, you know, what would be the odds? Well, one day he says to the, to the students, he says, let me ask you a question. He goes, you guys remember me telling about E9400? They go, yeah. He goes, I got a special guest here today. And they're like, what? And he goes, E9400 came here. He goes, let me go grab him in the hallway and grab him. Walks out, shuts the door behind him. The kids look around like, the guy, this is that story of this man he's told us about. So Jaime walks in, but it's just Jaime. He shuts the door, walks to the front room. They're thinking, where's E9400? And he says, I am E9400. And my friends, Jaime Molina, you are not what you did you are what you repeatedly do, and you are not who you are. You are who you were born to become. E, uh, Jaime is not E9400. E9400 was his prison number. It was a six-digit prison number. That was his identity. That's who he was. That's how he was known for many, many, many years of his life. That's not who he is. Who he is is the person he was born to be, which is he was born to be Jaime Molina, the father of four, the man that runs his you know, financial services business, the man that's a devoted a uh, husband, the man that's devoted in his faith, the man that's devoted to his friends. That's who he was born to be. That's so you start saying, who am I really? You know, and you start updating this. So James Clear, I'll give you an example. James Clear wrote the book uh, Atomic Habits. I know he just spoke. I think it was uh, was that Live to Lead he just spoke at? I know he's it was, it was at IMC in August. IMC. And he was on the podcast about a month and a half, two months ago. So he tells a story in, in Atomic Habits about two boys. One stole the candy and he says to the first child, did you steal the candy? This little boy said, I didn't steal it. They said to the second child, did you steal the candy? The little boy said, I don't steal. I didn't steal is an action. I don't steal is an identity. You can update this stuff and say, who is the person I was born to be and start acting as that one today? So I, I just got to pause. I am thoroughly and I will tell you this when we're done. I am so thoroughly enjoying this. I want all of you that listen and we have a lot of people that work out, drive, commute while they're listening. You said two things that cannot be overlooked and I don't have time to teach them. Justin has just killed it in teaching them. But one is update your identity. And every one of us need to update our identity. Even if your identity that you're holding is pretty good, if it's stale, you need to still update your identity. I don't care if it's good. I don't care if it's great. I don't care if you're living in yesterday's success. It's time to update your identity. And then this statement that you said that you're not what you did, you're what you repeatedly do, that is mic drop brilliant. It is incredible. That is the kind of things that Justin is talking about in the book. Be the one. Be the one. You need to pick it up. Let me go to uh, something else you say in the book. You say high performers can state what they want to achieve and why it matters to them without delay. Unpack that a little bit for us. Yeah. yeah so th this is an important. There's a 3D vision formula that I teach in the book, and this is very, very important, particularly in today's world. You know, we're in a tough economy. Uh, inflation's the highest it's been in 40 years. Interest rates are high. We're either in a recession or heading in a recession, depending on kind of how you want to look at it. A lot of businesses are down. We're having a lot of layoffs. It's a challenging time. So what do you, how do you get through challenge? How do you get through challenges in your marriage? How do you get through challenges in your business? How do you get through those personal challenges that you're feeling in your own heart, your mental health, your own, in your own life? And the answer is you lead with vision. So let me share with you a 3D vision. First thing is you define your vision. So defining your vision is creating clarity. So Brendan Burchard wrote a book called High Performance Habits. It's the largest study of high performers in human history. And he says, if you were to tap a high performer on the shoulder and you were to say to them, what's your latest dream? What's your latest goal? What's your latest vision for your life? A high performer can answer that question seven to 10 seconds faster 
than the rest of the population. Why? It's because they've defined it. It's a dominant thought. Your dreams in the back of your mind won't motivate you. They have to be on the tip of your tongue. One of the things that I've seen up from John Maxwell from behind the scenes. So this is stuff that I didn't see on a book or listen to on an audio or even from a stage. I watched him behind the scenes. He's in his 70s and he has more passion than everyone else in the room. Mm -hmm. I've never seen anything quite like it. You say, why? What, what, is it just because he's superhuman? It's because he has such clarity on the def definition of his vision, of what he's looking to accomplish. So your vision pulls you through hard times. So number one, you got to define it. Number two is you got to declare it. You declare the vision, right? You don't keep it in. <laughs> you want yeah. the vision to be declared. One of the reasons why is because it, it allows you to line up your private integrity and your public integrity. Public integrity, as you know, is what everybody gets to see how you act. Privates, when you're just all by yourself, how do you act? Who are you when no one's watching? When we declare our vision, we tell people, here's what I'm looking to accomplish. Here's what I'm looking to do. I remember saying to Mark, Mark, I'm going to go home and write a book. Well, man, that now holds me accountable to Mark. I don't want Mark to say, hey, how's the book coming? I'm like, oh, crap. Now, if it's if it's only on myself, I might let myself down. I might you know, not even you know, hold myself enough accountable to it, even though I try and keep my word. But to yourself, it's sometimes easy to break. But when you hold, you declare it to other people, then that leads to number three, which is you dedicate your life to it. You dedicate your life to your vision. You define it, you declare it, you dedicate. And remember my friends, vision answers a very important question. It's a question that's a subconscious question that your people that are following you as a leader, that they're all asking during tough times, that your children, they're all asking during tough times, that your spouse, they're all asking during tough times. Whenever times are tough, people are asking this question. They're asking the question, will it always be this way? If the answer is it will always be this way, then people make very different decisions moving forward than, no, it will not always be this way. Things are gonna change. The sun's coming up in the east, there's hope. The vision provides hope. The vision provides a destination that it's not always gonna be what we're going through right now. In other words, we're willing to, people can get through really, really challenging times if there's what? If there's vision. That's why one of the, there's an old Bible verse that says where there is no vision, the people perish. And one of the reasons that's so true is if it's always going to be this way, no one wants to keep pushing. But man, if it's not always going to be this way, if there's some hope, there's some vision, there's some life ahead of us, then we're willing to move through it. So the way you get there is you define it, you declare uh, you uh, uh, declare it to people, and then you dedicate your life to it. Brilliant, brilliant. I've got to get into one more segment of content before we run out of time, because you, you talk about the three C's to success. And uh, I can give you the three C's because it was profound to me. It was very helpful, but I'm gonna let you give the three C's. Talk a little bit about that. Unpack it for us. Yeah. It's one of my favorite things. So the first C is confidence. So it's a, it's a success loop. They loop together like this. If they just, you can spin these, they loop and th you'll notice you can create momentum with these. This it's a success loop. The three C success loops. The first one is confidence. The foundation of your success is believing in yourself. It's hard to get everyone else to believe in you if you won't even believe in you. It's hard to get everyone else to see what you see if you won't even see success in you. So you want to say to yourself, I've been through some hard things. I've overcome some challenges. Like I have some confidence in myself. When my spouse looks across me at the room and says through with her eyes, I love you. Thanks for providing a great life for me. I appreciate you. There's reasons you should have confidence. That should give you confidence. When, you're, when your children tell you, hey, mom, hey, dad, I love you. You know, when, you're, when the teams that you build and the, that you lead, these organizations that you lead, when they say, hey, thank you so much for the great work you do, the value you provide, that should re reinforce the confidence that you should have in yourself. So the, the foundation of your success is believing in yourself. Number two is commitment. Where there is no confidence, there is no commitment. Think about it this way. How, how committed are we to things we have no confidence in. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, I know my confidence level is a 0% we're gonna win. Well, I'm not that committed to this. And my friends, there's no lukewarm winners. You're either in or you're out. And if you're gonna be in, be all in. If you're gonna be out, be all out. You know, uh, Zig Ziglar once said, most people have the commitment level of a kamikaze pilot on their 47th mission. I mean, the point is they're just kind of in, then out, then out, then in. Build the confidence, I'm gonna go for it, I believe in myself, and then get fully committed, go all in. And then the commitment leads to competence. So what is competence? Competence is our skill sets. Competence is improving, growing. One of the reasons I love John and one of the reasons I love you listening to John, because you and I are kindred souls, yeah. our commitment to want to grow. 
Yeah. And what growing is, is we're building skills above our talent. Your talent, your floor, your skills are your ceiling. And I use the example in the book about Michael Jordan. So my brother and I, I was doing a personal development event in, in Orlando. This is last year. It's in September. My brother calls me, he says, are you still in my, in uh, Florida? I said, yeah, I was in Miami. I was in Miami, not Orlando. I'm sorry. I was in Miami. And he says to me, um, come over to Tampa for the, the, uh, the, the Florida to Gainesville, pardon me, the Florida Gators, the swamp. Yeah. yeah. And he said, I'll meet you there. Cause my beloved university of Utah youths were playing there. So we go to the game. My assistant buys us tickets and she gets us literally front row 50 yard line on the <laughs> Gator side, right on the Florida side. So <laughs> they, they call it the swamp and this place is an iconic you know, place. So I'm um, one of the things that hit me though, is I, I'm there enjoying the game is the Florida team. And I'm talking trainers, coaches, uh, players, they have all have the Jumpman logo, the Michael Jordan Jumpman logo. So on their yeah. on their shoulder pads, on their pants, on their towels, on their shoes, you know, and their shoes are cleats. And I just thought to myself, huh, how interesting is this? Jordan played basketball, not football. Jordan was known for his professional prowess, not college prowess necessarily. Jordan played 30 years ago. Here's all these kids. And it's cool to wear the Jumpman logo. And I thought, why? It's because Jordan is the GOAT. What made him the GOAT, the greatest of all time? That he built skill above the talent his he was very talented he could jump he was quick he could run the whole thing but he didn't he didn't rely on talent he built the skills he's one of the most fundamentally sound players ever he, he was all defense and all offense he built all these new skills above the talent as leaders we have to do the same thing it's one of the reasons i loved what john teaches john provides uh you know john maxwell coaching and so on why because it builds new skills so we don't just have to rely on our baseline talent now what happens when our competency increases well, man, the more competent we become, the more confident we become, the more confident we become, more committed we become, more committed we become, more competent, and it just starts to spin the loop. So let me ask one last question before we, uh, I'll throw it back to you, Mark, on this one. What do you do if today you're not feeling a lot of confidence? Like, you're like, hey, that all makes sense to me, but I don't, I'm having a hard time believing in myself right now. Okay. It's still a C word. I'll give you kind of a bonus C word, and it's courage. My friends, lean into your courage. Your courage precedes confidence. Courage is taking the step when you don't have a lot of confidence, you know what to do. Courage is starting the business when you're not totally confident that it's going to pan out. Courage is saying, I'm sorry, or I love you when you're not sure how this one's going to work, right? That's courage. Your courage precedes the confidence. You lean into courage and that will build to where you can get into the success loop of my, my confidence builds my commitment, which leads to my competence, which leads to more confidence. And you start to spin it. But today your home needs more courage. Your business needs more courage. Your team needs a leader with courage. Our country needs more people to have courage. So lean today into your courage. If you don't yet feel that strength in your confidence today, we're going to talk about New Year's decisions that mm -hmm. that you can think about, that you can make, that'll help you this year. So before we get started, I'd love for you to go to maxwellleadership.com slash podcast. And as you think about the year 24 and as we move forward, if there's a way that we can help you in executive uh, coaching or facilitation around content, we would love to do that. Well, as we reflect on the year past, we all go through this. We all do it. It's a great exercise to do, you know, we think about what went well, what could we have done better, what did we learn? So all of these lead to then decisions that you have to make. And you're the master behind all this content mm -hmm. that we create here. So obviously you've been thinking about some decisions mm -hmm. that are on your heart that you wanted yes. to kind of bring a lesson that maybe you've gone through recently over the last couple of weeks as you prepare for 2024. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, this one's personal uh, a bit is that, you know, thinking about are you going to make New Year's resolutions? Are you going to make set goals? What are you, I mean, I'm a big fan of goals and that sort of thing. But um, over the last couple of months, I've started recognizing in me that, um, you know, I think I have the best intentions about what I'm going to do and my goal and what I'm trying to accomplish. And, but I, I realized that, um, I'm way killing. I'll give you an example saying, are you going to work out today? You know, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking if I wait until today to make that decision and I wake up and I get up early and it's cold and it's dark and it's a chance of rain, I, I tend to make a decision in the moment based on all the circumstances. Yeah. And then it, uh, and this was just a, about six weeks ago. I remember this teaching from John. It's, it's quite, it hit me quite a bit in the past, but it really resonated with me then, but I completely pushed it out of my mind. And it, and the teaching was, 
decide once, manage daily. Mm -hmm. Decide which decide the big things that you're going to do and then manage it. You can't make the decision in the day, in the moment. I can't make the decision to work out at, at 5 a.m. when it's dark and cold and rainy. I need to have made that decision in advance and then manage it today when it's dark and cold and rainy. Uh, same okay. thing I was sharing with you. You know, we travel and I'm thinking I'm going to eat only yeah. eat salads with, uh, you know, Caesar salad with chicken. And then I've had a tough day. Uh, it's been a hard week. I'm on the road and I get into the restaurant and now I'm, I'm looking, I'm, now I'm choosing poor choices. You're looking at the dessert menu. Yeah, yeah, to I'm start thinking, yeah bring me the apple pie, <laughs> then I'll make a decision on the rest of the menu. Yeah. Okay. And because I, I, what am I comforting myself? Yeah. Whatever. Decide once. If I've decided once I'm going to eat a certain kind of diet, then I can manage it daily. And so it, no matter how I feel, no matter, I've already made the decision. I just need to figure out how I'm going to manage it yeah. today based on everything that's going on, all the circumstances, the ups, the downs, the sideways. I, I just need to manage it. I'm going to manage my, you know, these decisions I need to make. So I thought, uh, first of all, I'll get your thought yeah. on that because I know you've been around uh, John a lot and know this teaching. But also maybe we could look at in the new year, what are some decisions leaders need to be thinking about that we can love make it. once and then manage them daily throughout the year? You know, I love that. You mentioned um, about just being on the road and traveling, right? Mm -hmm. What I've noticed is that if I don't do this, if I don't make that decision and then have a plan to manage it, man, when we get tired in everything in life, that's when the guard goes down and you're just like, yeah, you know what? I told myself I wasn't going to open the menu, but now we're going to see what do they have. And so I love that, right? Because I think not only, you know, when you're, you got the energy in your, your A game, you're like, ah, good, I got this. I, I made this decision. Uh, but when you get tired, you got to have something in place that you can manage that. I th I'm just I'm laughing because you and I were traveling together about I don't know four or five weeks ago, and you had made a decision that you were going to fast. Yeah. But we were with a client. Yeah. And they were they were getting all this stuff ready. Uh, had all these <laughs> snacks. They even put you in an office uh, with mounds and mounds of snacks. of snacks. And they brought in these custom handmade donuts, and they and like everything within your face. And I just I was so proud of you because you you'd made a decision. I did. And then you managed it through the day, unless there was something I didn't see. No. Nope. But you managed it no. through that day to honor the decision you'd already made. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Podcast over. There you I go. Mean, That's yeah. it. Drop the mic. We're out. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good year. No, I'm just kidding. Well, yeah, let me come back to what you said about John because John is big about this. John is a – man, he is a – he calls himself a boring guy. He's like, no, 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 I know what I'm going to be doing, mm -hmm. right? And I do it every day. And that's what he says. The, the secret to your success – is determined by your daily agenda. I'll never forget, I've heard him say, if I've heard him say it once, I've heard him say it thousands of times. If I could just spend one day with you, I could tell right away whether or not you'd be a successful person. And what does that daily agenda look like? Because how are you managing your time? How are you managing your choices? And so you got to do it on a daily basis. The other thing I love about what he says is he says that successful people make the right decisions early they make them early, they make them quick, and then they manage them. So he has this thing called the Daily Dozen. You may, if you're a Maxwellian, as we call you, and you're <laughs> familiar with John's content, um, he, the, the, the Daily Dozen is 12 areas that really focus on one's daily routine. Some of them are around attitudes and uh, attitude priorities, health, family, finances, faith. But they, we're going to talk a little bit about that and the decisions you make as we go forward. He, he really talked about this, making the, man, the decision once. I thought, you know, could we look at some areas um, that might increase our effectiveness as leaders and, and d learn to decide once what it is we want to do in those areas and then manage daily? Uh, the three areas I just picked out, I'm kind of being, again, a little selfish. This is things I'm looking at me going forward, but I think it applies to all of us, is areas for consideration about you personally. So decisions you need to make about you, uh, about your team, areas that you need to make, decisions you need to make, and maybe about your business. Mm -hmm. So I'll throw them out and maybe get your feedback on them. But one of the decisions I made under thinking about me was um, about what do I need to decide about my personal growth? And in the new year, I need. I can't decide you know, when I get up in the morning. Am I going to spend a few minutes? Re I need to decide once and then manage it daily. But what's your thought on deciding once about personal growth? Yeah, I think what I love about this is, and I would love for you to talk a little bit about this because I, I learned this from you um, in the irreducible minimums. Mm. And I know that even an example with your, you know, your son or mm -hmm. someone that is not necessarily motivated every day. Uh, by personal growth, but know that we need to 
we want to grow, so let's manage that decision. Talk just quickly. For those that haven't listened to us, we've done an episode on this in, in the past. Just talk about the irreducible minimum and what that means. Yeah, the learning was, and I got this for myself first, but then talking, trying to encourage my son on some growth that he was doing, that he needed to do. I said, you know, what are you reading? I, oh, I don't have time to read. <laughs> and I thought that sounded like me. And uh, so the irreducible minimum idea is what's the minimum you could do in an area that you want to grow in that cannot be reduced, the minimum that cannot be reduced, irreducible minimum. And the idea is that I found for myself, I love to set big goals. Tell you what, I'm going to read 12 books in 2024. Well, that's a big leap if you're reading zero yeah. to get to 12. So instead of making a goal that's so large, you probably won't do it. That's set a right. goal that's so small, you'd be embarrassed not to do it. And so instead of having 12 books, I'm going to say, could I read two pages a day every day? And the, and the magic of this is the every day. And as John would teach that it, it, it's consistency that compounds over time. Yeah. My life motto became small things done daily, consistently, mm -hmm. over time, Same. remarkable results. Small things done daily, consistently, over time, remarkable results. So if you can figure out what the small things you could do, um, just decide, I'm going to do 15 minutes. I'm going to manage it tomorrow. 15 minutes, I'm going to read something uh but personally, I'm going to read something for business, and I'm going to write something. For me, that was kind of mine. I love that. No, and do it in a way, um, by the way, that fits your wiring. Mm. Right, let me say this, right? Some people are like, you know what? I'm going to get up at 5 every morning, and I'm going to work out, or I'm going to do my 15 minutes. You might not do that if you're a night night person versus a morning person, right? Mm. And my wife and I have this conversation. I'm a, I'm a morning person, but I'm worthless after 10 o'clock, <laughs> right? She is... A night person gets a lot of stuff done, but doesn't doesn't do well in the mornings. And so we talk about this as as your personal growth. Like, when do you schedule it in the day? You schedule in the day that it, it fits your wiring in order to continue to have success. Another decision, I think, for you on the topic of you, mm. you need to make once and manage daily is this idea about your physical fitness, your mm. your health. Uh, I know you've made some commitments on that, for and you're following that as a regimen. I've I have. Uh, this is one of the comfort areas. I had a, a knee surgery this year, and it's kind of set me back, and I've let that be a circumstance that I could still, now I'm making it every day when I get up, well, my knee hurt today. No, I need to <laughs> made it once to, to manage it, manage it within the fact that my knee is hurt. Uh, it's cold, dark, and rainy. What? How am I going to handle today's yeah. physical fitness? But your thoughts? The, I was in a meeting a couple weeks ago with a, an executive, and we were talking about this. I I saw his, his personal board as I went into it. It was awesome. Right in his office, he's like, here's my family and uh, my, my family and personal goals for this year, which was, you know, last year. And and one of them was, you know, weight loss. And he was tracking it. And he just has it out there for everybody. I was like, oh, t tell me about that. Uh, so we started talking. And he's like, you know, he said, I decided that I wanted to make a decision. And then – I needed to walk every single day. And I know you big, you know, tracking mm -hmm. your steps and all this kind of stuff. And he said, man, what I found was um, the, the commitment that I made to this, then I had more energy. It reduced my stress, right? Like, but I had to have it scripted and I had to have a plan so I could manage mm -hmm. when I was tired. And the plan was this. In the world of all of these Zoom meetings, he tried to get out as many Zoom meetings as he possibly could and went back to the good old-fashioned phone. Uh-oh. And he would put his headphones on and he would walk in all of his meetings. Right. The day, the, his greatest steps he had was 52,450 steps. And I was like, say that number again. I think the most I've ever had is in the 20s. And that's probably when I was on vacation, right, doing a tour. <laughs> and so he's like, yeah, like, no, I made a decision that any meetings that I can move. And when I have those meetings, that's my trigger. That's how I manage. I get up and I go walk. And he said, if the weather's bad outside, I get on my treadmill and I walk. And so he's like, I don't feel like it every day, which leads me to this phrase that I've used and have lived by for a while uh, with my kids, even with me. It's like, hey, you can't feel your way into acting. Mm -hmm. So back to this example, you know, I can't feel my way into going, oh, okay, I have a meeting where I am on the phone. I'm going to go walk. No, you'd already made that decision. And so what you got to do is make sure you 
act on the, how you manage that. And then, oh, by the way, once you get started, and you know this, mm-hmm. once you get started walking away, man, I feel like this is great. I want to keep yeah. doing that. So anyways, absolutely need to need to figure out how to do that. Let's move the topic to things about leading your team and are the decisions you need to make mm-hmm. once and manage daily. The first one I would throw out would be uh, determining proper priorities for the team and for yourself. But if you're not clear on what the priority, decide once what the priorities are and then manage daily how to execute those priorities. I get in trouble when I wake up and start to think, well, what's important today? I need to already know what's important today and then manage it today. Yeah. When it comes to this, um, I will sometimes use percentages of time. Sometimes I'll use lists. But none of this happens. Let me back up just a minute. None of this happens unless you're being very intentional about meeting and connecting and communicating with your team. And so what I want to encourage everybody is as you look through this is to make sure that you guys have proper alignment in your priorities is to communicate them back and forth periodically. Hey, what 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 do you think your top three priorities are? Mm. Hey, what percentage of time are you spending on this? We have an initiative right now at Maxwell Leadership where one of the things, it's a, it's a big priority for us. And so my mantra is, 70% of your time should be thinking about implementing or whatever around this idea. If it's not, let's have a conversation about it. Let's, let's talk mm-hmm. about it because I want to make sure that we're managing your time and 70% of it is focused on this. And that's kind of the mantra that we're using. And so absolutely, I think it's important when it comes to that. Uh, decision four, which would be the second one under uh, managing the team, I think that you should decide once and manage daily how you are going to build relationships and connect with people on your team. I guarantee you when you wake up in the morning and get to work, you are going to be highly distracted, highly uh, pushed. There's going to be lots of things coming at you. If you haven't decided that connecting and relationships are important and manage it throughout the calendar of the day and the week, it's not going to get done. Yeah. And you're going to end up at the end of a, a period, a month, a quarter, the year, and figure out why my team is so distant, why I'm not connected. Uh, so I need to figure out how I'm going to manage that daily. One of my uh, things I love to do is talk about college football. And I have a guy on my team who, man, it's just been something that we've done for a long time. And we get together and just catch up in college football and whatnot. And because my schedule has kind of gotten – a little crazy. I just, we haven't done it. And so I literally looked at my calendar and I was like, okay, that's it. <laughs> and so I was very intentional about how do I manage this, right? How I manage it to your point, I'm just going to put it on the calendar. So I found the first available day, put it on the calendar and I man, I made the decision. I needed to re-engage. I needed to re-engage around that. We have a lot of fun doing it. And so in order to help me manage that, one of the systems that I put in place is to Just go ahead and put it on the calendar and block it out and protect it. So there are little things like that that I think you can do, but it's so important to make sure that you're doing that, even with your people things, right? Even with that connecting, just go ahead and schedule it on your calendar. They don't, even if it's just the management by walking around, right? I know we've shared some leaders that they just don't do well with that. So they put it on their calendar at the certain time, Mm -hmm. get up for 15 minutes, go walk around, see what's going on. It may be painful for them, but they manage it, and that's how they work through it. But what's cool is that you, by you putting it on the calendar, you've already made the decision. Yeah. This is important. This is now, it. could something happen on the day when that? Yes, and you've oh yes, you have to re. But you won't cancel. You'll reschedule because now you're managing it in the day, not trying to decide how am I going to get it into my day. I'm going to manage it in my day because yeah. I've already decided it's important. Let's transition to the final one about leading your business. Mm. Are there some decisions you could make once managed daily? I, I, one of them I suggested was um, modeling. How am I going to model the core values of my organization daily? I think this is another one that I, <laughs> I get into the, the the rush and hustle of the day and then I I may just run right through some stop signs that my core values would say we shouldn't do. But if I've already, if I'm clear, I'm committed to, I'm making a decision on the core values, how am I going to manage those in the rush and hustle of my day? Yeah, remember what you do speaks so loudly that your team can't even hear what you're saying. And so you need to make sure that you are living those out on a daily basis. One of the things that I try to do is I try to use it in my language. Oh, yeah. Right? Like one of ours is, one of our values is exceeding expectations. And if I see something, either a team member has done peer to peer, maybe team has done for the client or whatever, I will say, hey, man, I loved when you exceeded expectations right here. Or growth is one of ours. Mm -hmm. Hey, man, man, I see so much growth in you. So for me, the way that I go about it daily is try to use our core values in my common language that I use throughout the day. 
I'll do it in presentations and I just try to kind of put it in there. I don't always remember what our core values are right off the top of my head. So what do I do to help me with that? I made the decision. I want to do this. So I actually have a little card that sits right next to my computer screen that I can see it that then goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I said I want to do this and I'm going to use this in my language. And so let me use this when I communicate to X, Y, and Z, yeah. as long as it's authentically right. uh, uh, tied into something that's happening. But I try to use that in my common language. Finally, a second one under leading the business, I said that um, leaders must make a decision to communicate the vision daily or, or on a regular basis. I think um, if I try to get into the day and I haven't decided, you know, what is the vision? How am I going to communicate that? It, it kind of comes haphazard. I don't I'm not clear. And so I think I'm going to decide once I'm going to really f figure out uh, that this, how to communicate the vision and then manage it daily through the, uh, the rush of business to get that vision in front of people's eyes and ears. And let me just add to that. Cause I think you said it extremely well, make sure that as you do that, you connect what they're doing to the bigger vision that you're communicating. Mm -hmm. You're communicating the vision of that team while you're also communicating the vision of the organization, which they should be in alignment, help them connect those dots. That's the key to that, is making sure that you're thinking about, hey, how does what Jake does right here on our podcast align with the fact that we wanna make sure that everyone deserves to be led well? What does that mean, right? It's because mm -hmm. we're going out to millions of people right, right. because of what they're doing. And so how do, you, how do you communicate that and then make sure that you tie that together? Well, as we wrap up today, um, man, on these decisions, we all have, we all have decisions we have to make. And you, maybe you've already, you're listening to this. You've already made some new year's resolutions as they call them here. <laughs> and so you made that decision. You made that choice. Now, how are you going to manage that on a daily basis? Because that's, that's how they end up failing. That's how they end up slipping away. That's how they get to a point to where you and I are on the road and retired. And you know what? I'm like, I'm not having a chicken salad right now. I'm going to have the biggest burger and fries and milkshake you. <laughs> that you could possibly have. Little things that we do lead to big things. And as Perry mentioned uh, in, in, the, in just a little, little while ago, he said from John Maxwell, consistency compounds. And so, man, we just got to do the little things on a daily basis extremely well. I have the best of intentions, yes. but I, when I get into the rush of the moment, the uh, the hurry of the day, uh, the the need for comfort, whatever it is, my excuse mm -hmm. may be. I I've not made that. Dis I'm making decisions on the fly. It's not good. Welcome to the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast, where our goal is to help you increase your reputation as a leader, increase your ability to influence others, and increase your ability to fully engage your team to deliver remarkable results.